I'm glad somebody's great. How's everybody doing? Come on, somebody. We're about to hear a powerful testimony. And when I tell you the attack against this testimony, like the, 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 since the storm, the computer kept going out and coming back, but we understand the enemy is the power prince of the air, but he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. When he called me about the storm, I was like, no, nah, we're we going to do it because it, your testimony needs to be out there. Amen. And even though we have people in attendance because we know the storm, we're still going live. And then if we can't, you know, we're going live over here and then we'll have a YouTube link so everybody can share to all of their friends. Amen. Because the Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies that we love not our life unto death. Amen. See, we can't forget that last part. Amen. And this is a man of God that has been a blessing to my life. When I first got out the program, God lined us up. We met we met in the field, right? We we met at the at the juvenile detention center at Rivard, someone pouring into the kids. Amen. So and after that we started doing outreaches and he got a heart of a servant. He 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 never says no. He never says no. He said, Well, I might be booked that day, but can we do it another day? Amen. So He's a real blessing to us and everybody that knows him. So I can't wait to hear this testimony. So let's just uh, pray it in. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We praise your holy name. Father, we just thank you for the man of God today that you have anointed to bring forth his testimony, which you have delivered him from and what you're doing in his life and what you're doing through his life. So, Father, we come against all things that are not of you. We come against every distraction. We bind it and break it right now. God, with devil, you have no place. Father, I pray that the hearts have already been prepared. Those that are going to watch online, Father, I pray that their hearts are already prepared to receive this word, Father, to hear this testimony. Father, for we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony so father i thank you for the testimony that you've entrusted him with to share with the masses for your word says have we been redeemed from the hand of the foe well, let the redeemed of the lord say so so father i thank you that he's saying so today so we stand in anticipation and expectation remove them and use them may he decrease and you increase in the almighty name of jesus christ we pray and let the church say Amen. God bless you, man of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I am honored. I am honored and humbled to be here uh, tonight. I tell you, many things uh, happen to abort, abort this, uh, this service tonight. And, and so we had already got in the mindset of uh, just doing a virtual, you know, because we didn't want to put people in harm's way of coming out in the storm. Those of you who are watching live, I mean, we got a tropical depression that's actually threatened to become a Category 1 if it hasn't become a Category 1. My wife said that she thinks she heard that it became a Category 1. So we got some strong winds out there, you know, tonight. So, you know, on our on your way home, please be careful. Amen. Please be careful. Uh, Andy said a few minutes ago that uh, he, uh, I don't never say no, you know, and I know it's probably some people that know me that uh, you probably uh, heard that and were like, well, he told me no, you know, because <laughs> I, I actually do say no uh, from time to time, but not to Andy because most of the time when he come, it lines up with what's my passion, you know. That's why I, I, we have a, a, a heart of the same passion. We believe in, in serving uh, the same God with the same aim for the same purpose, and I think that makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Again, I'm blessed to be here to share my testimony, to get the opportunity to share my testimony. The Bible says we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So I'm going to give you the word of my testimony through the relationship that I have by being covered by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Is that all right? Amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you. I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice and everyone that's watching, Lord, uh, via uh, online, however, virtually, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would bless each, each one of them, Lord God, with a seed of your word, Lord God, into their hearts, that it would produce the, the fruit that you desire for it to produce in Jesus' name, Lord God. You're the only one that's capable of keeping us. You're the only one that's capable of sustaining us, Lord God. And God, we're careful to give you the glory in Jesus name amen amen many of you know many of you don't know that I did serve time in prison I did 
uh, owner, uh, Andy had put up a post and he, uh, he used the word uh, murder. And, and sometimes I don't really like uh, that word. However, it's the reality. It's the fact. It's the situation that actually happened when I was 18 years old. And I ended up serving 10 years, three months, seven days, and eight hours behind something as small as a position in a store line. Yeah, I said that correct, a position in the storyline. By me being 18 and coming from a dysfunctional environment, coming from an environment that actually taught toxicity. Yes, I came from an environment where we thought that we, we I mean, you, that as far as pride, and I mean, it, 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 we really allowed that to, to lead us in the wrong places. And I felt like I had to tote a pistol around with me everywhere I went for the simple fact that I had been taught lessons after lessons after lessons that it was necessary. They even had things. You got to watch the media. They had uh, this Scarface thing going on, and Scarface toted a pistol around with him, and he called it his little friend. I, it was a catchy phrase, and I, I, I adopted that phrase. I liked it, that phrase, and I bought me a pistol, and I considered my pistol my little friend. And that little friend that I considered cost me 10 years, 3 months, 7 days, and 8 hours in prison. How did it happen, Carlton? And I'll tell you how did it happen. I was in a store line, and a guy, I never met him before in my life, cut in front of me in the store line. I could have let him go. I should have let him go. But I said something, because the egotistical mindset that I had that was pumped by pride, I said something to him, and he didn't like what I said. So he said something back. That's just the snap of a finger. That's how things get escalated. One thing led to another. We got into an argument. The argument led to a fight. Can I tell my testimony tonight? Yeah. A guy pulled the knife on me, not knowing I had a pistol. And I pulled the pistol to back him away from me with the knife, and I ended up shooting him. He died later on at the hospital. So there I was at 18 years old, facing a life sentence. And they were intent on giving it to me. I was a busboy. I worked in this restaurant from the time I was 14 years old, clean on up to the time I was 18 years old. And this lady who uh, I would call like a second mom, Miss Frankie Smith, she called the jail when she found out where I was at. Miss Frankie called the jail and Miss Frankie had the people in the jail to give me her number to call her. So I called Miss Frankie. And I said, hey, Miss Frankie, they gave me your number. She said, baby, how you doing? I said, Miss Frankie, uh, I guess as well as to be expected. She said, baby, do they have a church there? And I wasn't thinking about church at that time. It, to me, all church was was a dull, boring setting where a preacher got up and talked and bored a lot of people. That's what it was to me. But when she asked, because I respected Miss Frankie, I said, well, yes, Miss Frankie, I hear they have something like that. Well, Miss Frankie said, well, Carlton, give me your word that the next time they have it, you're going to go. I said, well, Miss Frankie, since you asked, I will. And the next time they had it, I was in there. And this old gray-haired preacher came in, and he started preaching. And when he was preaching, he talked about things that I had no idea about at first. And then he started talking. It actually was, it started off just like I thought it would, dull, boring, set. you know what I'm saying? And, and, but then he, he kept on talking, and throughout the process of the service, he captivated me. He started talking about things from when I was knee-high, clean on up to that particular point in time I was at, and it scared me. I looked at what he was saying, uh, the atmosphere, because there was over 30 people in there, but it seemed like he was talking just to me. I went back to my dorm, and I laid down in my bunk. And when I laid down in my bunk, it was then that God showed me that that was him speaking to me through the preacher, letting me know that in spite of what I had done, forgiveness and a second chance was available to me. I felt like I had committed the unpardonable sin. I felt like there was nothing that God would have to do with me. I felt like I was done. Life had ended for me. I'm facing a life sentence. This preacher come and he talks about this. What's, what's going on? And God showed me that that was him speaking to the preacher to me. So I got down out of my bunk and I laid down and I, I told God, I said, God, if that's you speaking to me, if that's you telling me about love, because he was talking about love and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ and the second chance opportunity that I could have. And I said, God, if that's you, 
I commit my life to you right now because I've made a mess of things. I, I, there's nothing that I can do beyond where I'm at right now. If you can do anything to help me, if you can do anything to assist me, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. And some people may say, well, look, you accepted Jesus Christ so he can do something. I was at the end of my rope. Everything that I could have done, I had done, and I had messed up. I needed somebody else to take the rein and do something different than what I had done. So, yes, I committed my life to God because there was nothing else I could do with me. And from that point on, when I got up off my knees, I started reading the Bible. I started studying the Bible, and God began to show me some things. He began to show me some things that, hey, look, uh, that it, the more I got to know about God, the more I got to know about myself, the more I got to know about other people. God just began to show me some things. And then shortly after that, this is where the tables turned there. Shortly after that, the detective that was over the case, I'm facing a life sentence at 18 years old. The detective that was over the case, he created what I never was supposed to get, and I didn't even talk to him outside of the beginning of the case. He created what I never was supposed to get, and that was a preliminary hearing. At the preliminary hearing, the detective got on the stand and testified on my behalf. That was something he did not have to do, but he did it. What that did was gave me, and I, I, when I'm watching him give the testimony, I can remember his testimony just like it was yesterday. The detective said that the victim at one point in the incident was the aggressor towards Carlton Bethel with a dangerous weapon, and he responded in the manner that he did because he felt his life was in danger. And I was like, this dude didn't have to do it. He was a white guy, white law enforcement agency. He didn't have to do that, but he put his neck on the line, and he knew that the situation, the circumstances, and, and he got on the stand. He testified on my behalf. That was no one but God. God touched his heart. God touched his heart to do that. I'm sure that may have been in all kind of family members or whatever uh, speaking against him to do what he did because he put his neck on the line. And as a result of that testimony, it gave me an opportunity to see society again. If he had not gave that testimony, I know this. Nobody else has to know this. If he would never have gave that testimony, I didn't have the money to pay him. I didn't have the money to pay a lawyer. If he never would have gave that testimony, today I would still be in prison doing a life sentence. But as a result of his testimony, they dropped the second degree murder charge and gave me a manslaughter charge. And I ended up getting a 21 year sentence where I did 10 years, three days, I mean, three, 10 years, three months, seven days and eight hours. Yes. And I did the rest of that time, that 21 year sentence on the outside on parole. But here's the thing. Once I gave my life to God on the inside of prison, I did that time as a Christian. There was no distractions. Life had stopped, and I could read. The Bible. There was nothing else to do. I could read the Bible, study, and learn how to become a better person because that's what I wanted to leave out of prison as, as a better person. I wanted to develop my life. The Bible said that God had a, and this is what blew my mind, the Bible, as big as God is and almighty as God is, he had a specific purpose, an identity specifically designed for me. And I could learn, I could understand, I could find out about that specific purpose and identity through reading, through learning, through studying the pages of the Bible. And I began to dig for it like I was digging for treasure, like I was digging for gold. And I was finding treasure and I was finding gold. There are so many stories, like even with King David who wrote, what is man? Because see, I was a man. When I read what King David had said, I understood his expression. What is man that you are mindful of him? I needed God to be mindful of me. What is man that you are concerned about him, that you would sup with him and come and visit him? You would make your presence known to him. Those things, when I began to read them in the Bible, made sense, jumped out the page of the Bible, and they let me know that I was loved by God, that I could make an impact, that I can fulfill a purpose here on the earth. I don't just have to exist. I was all done. So what you're telling me, I don't just have to exist? There's something beyond just existing? Show me, God. Teach me, God. I want to learn. So because I was in prison, that didn't stop me from being a vessel for God. I just wanted to do what was right before God. 
So when I got to the pen, right, God did several things that showed me that he was real. Can I tell you one? When I got to the pen, I was in the field working. And if you don't know what the field is, the field is a place that anytime you get there first, you have to go out to the field at least six months first. Before you can get any job on the compound, you have to work the field. The field is the hardest labor. That's when they say hard labor, that's what they're talking about. We were cutting down trees, watching them fall, cutting them up, and we would make competition out of them because we wanted to, we, we, we were doing time, we ain't got nothing else to do, so you know, it was the field. It was work, you were goose picking. Those of you who watch it know what I mean when I say goose picking. Some of the worst, uh, boring and uh, the hot and pain, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And so here's the thing. This one particular time we were out there, I got sick. My body started aching. Most like pneumonia. I don't know what it was. Could have been a combination of the pneumonia flu. Could have been COVID. I don't know what it was. You know, and this was in 1994 at this particular time. And so I got sick. My body was aching. And we had, we, we do two phases in the field. You do it in the morning. You come back in, you eat lunch. You go back out to the end of the day, right? So this is in the morning when I got sick. So we go back in to eat lunch. I eat lunch. I knew my body was too weak to make a second half. So you know what I said? I said, I know I'm not going to make a second half. If I don't make it, they're going to lock me up. So I said a small prayer to God, nonchalant prayer. I would talk to God and pray to God just like, you know, that I'm talking to my best friend. I would talk to God and I would be like, hey, look, God. I, to I told him, I said, God, look, I'm sick. I don't know what it is. I feel like pneumonia flu. I don't know what it is. And I know that they're not going to allow me to quit and not go back out on the second half. The only thing that would keep me from going back out is if it rained. It's the only thing that would keep the whole crew from going back out is if it rained. If it rained hard enough, they'd shut it down. But the day was sunny. It was bright and sunny day. Sky was just as blue, no clouds nowhere. But I prayed that prayer, and I forgot I prayed it. It came time to go back out for work crew. They called every work crew. I was on the last work crew, which was work crew six. They called everybody's name out. When they called my work crew out, it was the last one. And we got ready to start marching. The moment we started marching, mind you, it was a sunny day. The clouds, were, the clouds were not out. The skies were blue. The moment we took our first steps, it started pouring down raining. Pouring down raining. They shut it down. They stopped. They sent everybody back, back in. But do you know I was outstounded? Because I believe God did that to show me that I see you. I want you to see me. I want you to know that I'm real. There are things that I go through right now today, and I think about how important I was to God that day, that day. In the Bible, it tells us to remember and remember and remember. And that day, God showed me, I see you. I'm concerned about you enough to make it rain. And so we went back in my heart, man, I was, my faith just jumped through leaps and bounds, and I was excited. I was like, hey, God, look, if you can make it rain. I mean, about this healing, you know, the Bible does say you sent your word to heal. The next day I went to sleep. I went to sleep, woke up the next day, and I felt like I could fight Tyson. Yes. And of course, it would be crazy to fight Tyson, but I felt good. I felt good that God healed me. God began to show me that he, he was personal, and he loved us enough to meet needs. Just Some needs we think are small or insignificant, and God showed me in prison that I love you. I care about you, and I'll meet your needs. It was outstanding to me. So I just wanted to do what was right. I just wanted to do things that were good. They had this band in the church, and nobody wanted to get the uh, equipment. For, they had a church in prison. Nobody wanted to get the equipment for the church. And I was like, well, I mean, it gave you an opportunity to get out early, and you, you were doing it for the church. So I was like, if nobody wanted to do it, I'll do it. The equipment during the time that I did it was never there late and was always taken down on time. I did it because the Bible says that anything you do, do it as if you're doing it unto the Lord. And I had just found that scripture, and I wanted to do everything that I was doing. In spite of the fact that I was in prison, I wanted to do 
everything that I was doing as if I was doing it unto the Lord. And when I tell you that people begin to recognize that on the inside of prison, the chaplain began to recognize, well, who is that guy right there? Uh, why is the equipment is always there earlier? It wasn't always there earlier. Who, who's responsible for getting the equipment? And they took notice because I was doing things, and because I was doing it in the character that said, God, I wanted to honor you. It, it, people, it, I, don't, I never did want attention. I only wanted to do it for the glory of God. But when you do things for the glory of God, it draws attention for people that really matter. And God gave me that facility. When I tell you he gave me that facility, I, I had been there for about two and a half years, man. And, and the, the pastor said, Carl, let's take a walk. With the walking, he said, look, I'm about to leave. And when I leave, somebody's going to have to take the, uh, take the reins for the church. I'm 20 years old, y'all. I'm 20 years old. He said, uh, who do you think? Craig E. Jones is his name. I want to give honor to Craig. Craig E. Jones, he'd always say that the E is for Emmanuel, which means God with us. Craig is no longer here with us anymore. He died in a car accident in 1999. Yeah, but he was one of the most wisest men. If I ever had to consider anybody a spiritual father, it would be Craig E. Jones. He told me, he said, who do you think, Carlton, would be responsible enough? Who do you think would fit for when I leave to take my place. And I named out some, some great, they had some great speakers there, and I named out a few of them. He said, yeah, they do, they do speak pretty good. He said, yeah, they are capable of this and capable of that. He said, but can I tell you something? I said, what's that, Craig? He said, God showed me you. I'm 20 years old. I'm 20 years old. I was like, Craig, that's a big responsibility. He knew that I would say that. He said, I know, and I knew you would say that. He said, give me, you take enough time to pray about it. He said, I want you to pray about it. Tell me what you think. I went back and I was praying. I mean, I was a prayer warrior, and I would pray. I would bring that time doing things. Yes, you know, I pray. Nothing else was going on on the facility that concerned me because I love God, and I knew I didn't belong there. Even though I had did something that put me there, I knew I didn't belong there, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. I wanted to develop who I was as a person. I wanted to develop the whole man. I wanted to develop myself spiritually, mentally, and physically, and I meant it. And so when he said, hey, look, just pray about it. I prayed about it. I prayed a lot. But this particular time when I prayed, I was praying and laying in my bunk. I, I didn't kneel on me. I was just praying. I prayed all the time. The Bible said pray without ceasing. I took that literally. I was praying all the time. I was laying on my bunk and I was just praying. And as I was praying, it was like the, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, there was an overshadowing feeling. I can't even explain it. I can try to explain it. It may I make it sound magical or anything, but there was an overshadowing peace that, put, that caused my body to shudder. As I was praying about that decision, and immediately I knew that God approved me making that decision to be the pastor of a Winfield Correctional Facility. He approved that. And so I got back and I, called, I, told, I told, I said, I called. I, 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 the next time we went out, we ain't had no phones up in there. Yeah, I hear they got phones now, but I mean, we didn't have no phones up in there. Yeah, and so the next time we had a, a, a call out, I went to the call and I talked with Craig, and I was like, Craig, God gave me my answer. He, he said he approved it. It's okay. Uh, and he said, okay, I'll make the announcement. And he made the announcement. I became a pastor at 20 years old on the inside of prison. And he had a friend of mine. I had a name of Luther Trailer. He's a friend of mine now. And, 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 and when, past, when, when Pastor Craig left, he had Luther to assist me and to help me because he knew that Luther, Luther was... Um, Luther was capable. Luther, Luther was, uh, uh, he was older, and Luther could actually uh, help, uh, help, help, how was the word, mentor me in that position. Because honestly, he gave, I knew how important that role was, how important that responsibility was. But at 20 years old, I wasn't a pastor. But David wasn't a king at 17 either, you know. And, and so, but I was serious about doing the best I could. And sometimes you just have to be serious about doing the best you can with where you at. And, and I did that. And as I did that, God developed me to be one of the best pastors that I can honestly say that ever came through the Winfield Correction Facility. And I say that because the people tell me that, you know. There were people that I passed. And I say I passed. I, I overseen, you know. And, and sometimes I just, uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to, I don't like to, uh, you know, I'm trying to be humble. Sometimes I may be over humble, you know. But and, and they, they still call me pastor. 
you know, and God has called me out to be uh, a street pastor. Andy put, mentioned it in the, uh, in the actual post, you know, but I pastored on the inside of prison, and I did a phenomenal job caring for the people, caring for the flock. And I say that, and I don't say that to boost my horn, but I say it because the people said it, you know. Yeah. Praise be to God. When I talk about Craig as a mentor, he was one of the best mentors, man, that I ever came in contact with. Craig took me for a walk, and he said, Carlton, I want you to always remember. He said, I want you to always remember that anytime you're listening to anyone speaking, anytime you're, you're actually uh, or you, you, you're opening yourself up to anyone speaking, he said, some great speakers. He said, even when I get up and speak, he said, I want you to always take your spiritual rake and your spiritual shovel with you. And I said, what do you mean by spiritual rake and spiritual shovel? He said, because people are subject to error. He said, but with your spiritual rake and your spiritual shovel, you can rake in the good and shovel out the bad. And that's one of the things that he taught me that I never forgot. I never forgot. Amen. So I, I, I tell you, uh, God's just good, man. God's good. God's incredible. And that's, that's for, and for me to say, God, God used me. He used me. It, my testimony is just not about the prison, though. I kept saying there's stories within stories, stories within stories. There were so many stories from the testimony of just being saved, but there were other stories as well. Like I, while I was, some of the things I went through in prison caused me to remember a situation that happened on the outside when I was a kid. And I call it the donut story. I've always told that story uh, several different times. And, uh, can I share it tonight? Yeah, man. Stories within stories. Now, this story has to do something with uh, my brother and my sister and my dad. My dad came in one night from work, and he always would, uh, he, what he would do was, he would, it, it taught me something. He, he, what he would do with my dad, he, he, he came in this one particular night with a dozen of donuts, and he laid the donuts on the table. And when he laid the donuts on the table, he went to bed. I had to get up late to actually use the restroom. But the table was directly, when you're going in the hall, you can see the donuts on the table before you go in the restroom. So I saw those donuts on the table, so I would use the bathroom. And I, after I came out, I did a little investigation. I went to check out those donuts. And, and yes, it was donuts. When I, it was, I didn't know what it was. At first, I wanted to check out the box, and it was donuts. And I was like, wow. And nobody was up with me, so I looked around, and I got me a donut. I came back to my room, and I thought I hid it from my brother, but my brother saw that I had got me a donut. So he eventually got down and went to investigate what I had. And he saw, and he got him one. And so I ended up, I, the donut was, it was a Dunkin' Donuts. And Dunkin' Donuts had the same thing as uh, Lay's potato chip. You can't eat just one. Yeah. So I, I went, and I got two donuts, two more donuts, uh, three donuts. My brother saw what I had. He didn't want me to outdo him, so he went and got him two more, too. So it was six donuts actually gone from a whole dozen of donuts. Well, we were good. The six donuts done us good, right? So the next morning came up. My dad went back up in the living room, and he saw that on that table that he had put a dozen of donuts down there, but there was only six there now, so somebody had to answer for those six that was missing. So he called us in his room. He said, Keto one, Keto two, Keto three. Now, I never knew what Keto meant, but I knew that when the time my dad said Keto, that meant somebody was in trouble. So when he called us Keto 1, Keto 2, Keto 3, now the 1, 2, 3 was the order that we were born. My brother was born first, I was born second, and my sister was born third. He said, I had, six, I had, I had a whole dozen of donuts, six of them gone. Somebody's going to answer for these donuts. Where my donuts gone? Of course, I'm like, you didn't see me eat them. Not me. Yes, kids lie. I don't know, don't tell them a kid, that kid, I lied. I was about nine years old at that time. And I said, not me. My brother said, not me. I knew he was lying because I seen him. And my sister, she was innocent as all I know. She said, not me, daddy. And she was about five years old. I was nine, my brother was 10, my sister was five. And so he said, somebody gonna tell me who ate those donuts. And I was like, well, as long as he don't know, yeah, I'm good. So he's like, all right, you ain't gonna tell me? He said, baby boy, go get me a, a butcher knife at the, uh, at the front. Butcher knife. Uh, dad, dad's bluffing us. He's bluffing us. So I go get the butcher knife. I'm like, I'm, the whole time I'm saying to myself, he ain't going to do nothing with that butcher knife. I mean, we as kids, he love us. You know, I think I'll go get the butcher knife. I know he ain't going to do nothing crazy. And so I go get the butcher knife and I come back. And when I come back with the butcher knife, um, hand it to him. He said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. He said, I want you to lay down over my knee with your stomach up. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut your stomach open and see which one of y'all ate my donuts. Because I was really wanting to eat them donuts. And so I'm like, well, that ain't, I mean, he, he's our dad. He's, he loves us. He's not going to do no harm with us. He's just bluffing. So I laid down. And he let the tip of that knife touch my stomach. And I tell you what, I didn't know he wasn't going to do it or not. I came up screaming, Dad, okay, I ate some donuts, but I only ate three. <laughs> I only ate three. I, I was on, I'd be accountable for three. He said, okay, well, you, you get over there in that corner. He called my brother. He told my brother, he said, all right. He said, you lay down on me. I want to cut your stomach open and see if you got some donuts up in you. My brother didn't even lay down. He said, Dad, okay, I ate some donuts. I ate some donuts. And he looked at my sister, and he told my sister, he said, come on, you next. And she said, Daddy, you're going to have to kill me because I ain't ate no donuts. And she, <laughs> and she was serious. She had not ate any donuts. So what he did, he believed her, and he, had, he got the right number. I ate three, but ate three. So what he did was he gave her the other six donuts, and he made me and my brother sit right there in front of her and let her eat them in front of our face. I said, I tell you the truth. But the story, the lesson in that story that was within the story was to me was, and it was from my sister. Now, my sister was as innocent in this particular situation. She was as innocent as they come. And the lesson was that even though she was innocent, she still had to suffer with us. But in the end, she was rewarded. Sometimes the innocent has to suffer and go through some struggles or go through different obstacles here and there. But in the end, we have to understand that God sees us and he'll reward us when we stay faithful. Now, my sister was innocent then. Now, she ain't all that innocent now, but I mean, she was innocent then at five years old. She was the most innocent thing you could ever lay your eyes on. Amen. Praise God. Man, we got a storm out here and this storm is cutting up. I, I tell you, uh, it's out here all, all, all the way uh, through. We got, we, got a, we got a nasty storm. We got a nasty storm. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is how I ended up in, in, in South Louisiana. There's a story to that. After I got saved and uh, in, in, in prison, I came home. I, I, one of the things that got me while I was on the inside of prison was there were so many people that were smart, intelligent, that were doing some great things. And so when they got out, they would, even the ones that, that had a great plan, a, a great agenda for when they got out, so many of them came back. And I prayed to God. I said, God, I don't want to be like that. Why? Why are these guys that are good guys that have a good heart, why are these guys uh, going out and they're coming back in as if uh, they didn't learn anything? And I know that they were full of knowledge. I knew they were full of wisdom. And God showed me something. He said, Carlton, he showed me. He showed me how so many people on the inside of prison become complacent with the environment of prison within itself because out here we have responsibility. Out here we have things that we have to, as a man, especially as a man, things that we have to, we have to, uh, we, we, we have to uh, be accountable for. And, and when you're in prison, you don't. People do everything for you. You get frustrated out here when you, when you, when you have the responsibility and, and the resource. And so, and so God showed me that that's why so many of them come back. I said, God, teach me how to deal with those particular circumstances. Help me not to become complacent with this environment so that I can come out of, of this prison facility and go back out in society and make a difference, make an impact, leave a dent in the earth. And God just began to show me how to be resourceful. And he showed me through the pages of the Bible, through the different stories. I'm not going to go through the different stories. This is a testimony night, right? I'm not going to go through the different stories, but there were so many stories that taught me by way of example and one of the things that, that he spoke to me about with, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Genesis or Exodus, when it comes to Moses, God spoke to Moses and, and told Moses uh, several times, fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes fear cripples us. Sometimes fear hinders us, and, and it keeps us from being able to stand still and allow God to do something, Right? It paralyzes us, and God showed me how important it is to don't be afraid, be courageous in knowing that God has our back. I shared the thing about the covenant relationship. That meant something to me because being in covenant with God says that whatever comes up against us is coming up against God because we're in covenant relationship. So I believe that, and I trust it. I said when I got out in society, I knew that anything that came up against me, regardless of how big it seemed, because David was big, or giant, uh, Goliath was big in the face of David. David, but God was with David and David was able to overcome it. I should be like David. 
We should be like David. If he did it for David, he can do it for us. That's what I said. That's the mindset. That's the confidence that I have in God. And I, I, I know I haven't been perfect. I know I haven't been completely, but I do know that I have a heart for God. And I strive every day to be complete in God. I strive every day to be in right standing with God. And when I miss the mark, it's good for me to know that God is faithful. When we miss the mark, it's good for us to know that God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us and to replace, restore our relationship with him. Amen? Amen. It's important. It's important. It's important. The way I ended up in South Louisiana was when I went to go up for parole. When I went to go up for parole, I had done seven years. I got shipped out of Winfield which meant that my pastoral ship over there ended, but it started even when I went back to, when I went to, when I went to Alexandria. I became a minister over there. Everywhere I went, I would just open my mouth, and people would think that I needed to be teaching somebody. <laughs> yeah, and it was, and it was duly because I had, I had learned. I, was, I had learned through the season experiences of God. And so when I went over there, uh, my parole date came up, seven years. I had, I had 21 years. Once I had done a third of that, that, that 21 years, I went up for parole. And so when I went up for parole, I had been, we had studied Bible study and everything. I was for sure that I was going to make parole because I was God's child. I was God's son. I was faithful to God. I just knew that I was going to make parole. But they denied me. The only reason they denied me was because of the seriousness of my offense. We had established a Bible study within the group. And when I came back into the facility, when I came back into uh, the actual dorm, there was a, the group was waiting on me. They was waiting on me to give them the news that I thought I would be able to give them when I came back in. They said, hey, what happened? And I said, they denied me. You got to be kidding me. They thought I was joking. I said, no, they denied me. And I, when I tell you that was a crisis of my faith because I had been serving God, I had been faithful to God for those seven years. It was, I, I was faithful to God. But sometimes we don't see what God has on the other side. And God had something on the other side that I didn't see. But I had to work through some things. I had to learn that some of the things that we just expect to believe or hope in our own flesh, sometimes those doors are going to be closed. Sometimes those doors are going to be shut because we don't see what God has for us. And sometimes God protects us by telling us no or allowing us to be told no. And there was this one guy named Frankie Lee in Alexandria, Louisiana. Frankie Lee came up to me. He said, Carlton, I, I sure hate. I sure hate you didn't make parole. That's what he said. He said, but I'm so glad. You're going to still be here, man, because I got a lot I want to learn from you, man. And when he told me that, I looked at Frankie, and although I understood what he was saying, it just wasn't what I wanted to hear at that time, right? Yeah, but he told me that, and I understood what he was saying, and I, and I taught him everything I knew from the biblical standpoint during the time I was there. But it was shortly after that, I got shipped to Farmerville. When I got shipped to Farmerville, I met the guy who was responsible for allowing me to connect with a company that I've worked for for the last 13 years, before the pandemic anyway. The pandemic shut a lot of things down. But I met a guy by the name of Gary Hopkins. I call him G-Hop. Yeah, me and, and Gary, we, uh, Gary was a businessman. He was a man that, that uh, he ended ended up in jail because he was a businessman. He was selling the wrong products, right? And so he ended up in jail. And he gave his life to the Lord while he was there. And he wanted to be a businessman from a different level when he came out. And now he's an effective businessman uh, uh, right now on different angles. The boy was smart. The boy is smart and brilliant. But I met Gary, and that was the connection that I had. I never would have met Gary if I got set free and delivered uh, from Alexandria. If the parole would have set me free, I never would have met Gary. But when I met Gary, we orchestrated a, a, a choir there uh, through our Bible study in Farmerville. That's where I was at, in Farmerville at Union Parish facility. And our choir ended up going out. They had never did that before into the free world and singing and preaching. I ended up getting the opportunity to preach as an inmate in the churches in Union Parish. Ain't that something? And, and, and so that, that had never happened. They just wanted to hear what the inmate who was stirring up so much in the, in the facility had to say to the people on the outside. And it opened doors for us. It opened doors for us. And so when I, when, when I actually came home from prison, I had talked with Gary, and we kept in contact, and Gary knew I wanted to a shot in the oil field. And, and so Gary ended up getting a shot in the oil field first, before me, right? And he knew I had a desire. He called me. He said, hey, man, look, I'm in this good company, and they, they, they got, they're hiring. They're open, they got some openings, man. I think you'd like it. Give them a call. So I called the guy, and uh, the guy, I, I said I called the guy. I did call the guy. The guy that I called, I, took, I dropped him to the, at the airport yesterday. The, the guy that I called then sure did. He called me uh, a couple of days ago and said, hey, look, Carlton, uh, look, uh, 
you got any service? You know any service that'll take you to the airport? I say, Paul, my name was Paul Robichaud. His name is Paul Robichaud. I say, Paul, I'll take you to the airport. I took him to the airport yesterday. But when I called him, when Gary said, hey, look, man, they, they got a job opening, I called him. Paul answered the phone. He said, yeah, we got a job. When can you be here? And at this time, I was actually working for a, a tow truck company. And I said, well, I mean, I'd like to give these people at least a couple of weeks notice. He said, that's great, Carl. Now, we, we like the fact that you would consider that, that you would even think about that. That's, that's awesome. But I got to tell you, in two weeks, I can't promise you that this job is going to be open and available for you. And I was like, oh, man. I said, well, so when do I got to be there? He said, we're going to need you here tomorrow by 10. I see you tomorrow at 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I told him, I see you tomorrow at 10. So I called the man up. I said, hey, look, this is an opportunity that I had wanted, I had, I had prayed for, I had believed God for. And so I called, uh, I called the man in the only other company. I said, hey, look, I got an opportunity that presented itself to me, and they want me in South Louisiana at 10 o'clock. And he was like, uh, so where are you saying, Carlton? And I said, hey, Mr. Ricky, I love him, though. He, uh, he said, uh, what would I have to do to keep you? And that was evidence that I was a good worker. He didn't want to lose me, right? And I said, well, Mr. Ricky, they talking about paying me $1,000 a week. I mean, if you can match that, I'll stay. Well, <laughs> that's what he said. If anybody watching this live that know how he talk, they probably busting out laughing. Yeah, but it, he say, uh, well, uh, if I had that opportunity, I'd probably take it too. He said, <laughs> he say, this is what he said. He say, right, but, but you'll never work for me again. I understood that I didn't intend on working for him again. And, uh, but his wife said, Carlton, you never mind Mr. Patsy. She said, Carl, never mind him. He, he just upset because he know he's losing a good worker. Baby, you got an opportunity to better yourself. You go right ahead. And I said, all right, thank you. And we, got, we ended on a good note. And I went, 10 o'clock, man, and uh, met Paul Robert Show. Paul Ro and this is how God worked, man. I went to culinary art school while I was in prison. Can I share my testimony? Yeah, I went to culinary art school while I was in prison. And I never thought that that uh, certification, it was a certification. It had the prison name on the certification. So I wasn't really expecting the prison name on the certification to give me a job like I ended up landing, right? And so I'm in there to be a, a, a rigger. I go there to be a rigger. I'm there to be a rigger. And so they come in, but I gave them a whole resume, everything in my resume. They said, hey, Carlton, Paul Robert Show. He said, hey, Carlton, come to college for a minute. I said, hey, what's up, Bob? So you, you got culinary all. Uh, Certi cert uh, degree, cert certification. Yes, yes, sir, I do. Man, I just, we need a culinary chef right now. You have no idea. I mean, look, if you want the job, it's yours. I said, well, give me the numbers. And he gave me the numbers, and it was significantly higher than what I was there for. And I was like, hey, I'm your man. And they sent me up. And, I, and, for, the, and for 13 years, up until April the 8th of last year, I served as the chef for Danos, uh, let's say Danos and Carole Marine Contractor, but Danos and Marine Contractor. I served as a chef, but not only as a chef, I mean, I, I cooked for team uh, building projects, different things like that. I, was, I cooked for different marketing events. I mean, it was an incredible team, and it was one of the best things that happened to me in that process because I learned, because I actually uh, developed who I was, because they allowed me to be around people like millionaires. Hey, they, yeah, they, they, they know. Yeah, yeah. They allow me to be around millionaires. And the thing about it, they knew I wasn't afraid to ask questions. And I wasn't afraid to ask questions because I knew I, who I was in God. And I knew that everybody that I was around was a human just like me. And, and, and so, if, I mean, it, it, and it was a Christian organization. I don't think, I, they weren't just no uh, a, a, a cutthroat organization. These people were Christian. The owners were Christians. And, and, and they respected people who wanted to develop, who wanted to be better, who wanted to grow. And so I was one of the person who wanted to do better, who wanted to develop, who wanted to grow. And so the one time I got an opportunity to take the man, the man himself, that I would transport him to, uh, uh, I did everything for him. I would transported him to uh, uh, a location that he wanted to go to because he had some business over there. And so I had him in the car. I was like, I got all this wisdom in the car with me. I got all this knowledge in the car with me. I got to ask him something. So I asked him, I said, hey, um, Mr. Hank, I love Mr. Hank. Mr. Hank, um, can I ask you something? Sure, Carl. I say, uh, if you had to say what your key to success is, what would you say? And Mr. Hank looked at me, he said, Carlton, you know, more people need to ask questions like that. 
That's interesting that he would say that. You know, I thought he would be like, well, why are you going to ask me a question like that? Like, Drive. You know, no, but he said, more people need to ask questions like that. Then he went to talk, on deep talk. I, I respect Mr. Hank uh, Dillard. He, he went in deep talk. He said, uh, you know, I wouldn't just say it was, um, it's just one key. And he, he pinpointed how, you know, he gave his life to the Lord, you know, fresh out of high school, and uh, how discipline was uh, a big factor. He gave me that information, and he told me how, you know, he just he, he would talk. He said a lot of things, you know, but one of the main things he told me was, you know, there were many things that some of his friends were doing that he wanted to do, but he was disciplined to do what he knew that was in his path to do and that God wanted him to do, and that, that was his pathway of success, discipline. He talked about a lot of other things, but he kept going back to the word Discipline, how necessary, how important, how it takes preeminence over so much, the discipline. But the first thing he did say, though, is he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ fresh out of high school. And God gave him the strength to execute the discipline that was needed. Praise be to God. Amen. So that's how I ended up in South Louisiana. And when I went through that, uh, that, that parole, when I went through that parole denial, it, like I say, it devastated me. But I didn't know that I would meet the guy that would paint the pathway, that create the pathway of meeting, introducing me to the people who would, who, who would create the avenue for me to make a living in South Louisiana for the last 13 years. And now, after here's the thing. The lessons that I learned from those people that I met, I can go anywhere right now. Of course, I didn't like being told that I was going to be laid off in 2020 in April the 8th, but I wasn't afraid because I had learned so much. Honestly, it was like a slingshot that was giving me an opportunity to become the person that God had taught and developed me throughout the years. I had already started operating and running my own hotshot business on the side. It was just a side hustle. That's all it was that I thought. And then when the, when, when, when the layoff came, it had to become the main thing. It had to become the main scope, the main avenue uh, of my finance. And so I went full-fledged into what was supposed to be just a hustle. But I took the lessons that I learned through the company of Danos and just being around the people that were willing and, and, and uh, just freely gave me information, knowledge, inspiration, and just the keys to how to make business work. I was teaching in a team building project, and one of the team building projects was to look at a Lego item, a Lego block, and, and to actually look at the item, and, and, and it was, they had team, two teams, and the, the thing was to actually look at it and then go back and tell your team all the details that you saw in that Lego image. That you, when I tell you, it's amazing how many details is in a Lego block image. And that was the thing, and the key was to pay attention to detail, regardless of where you at and how you operate or what business you got. Paying, a de paying attention to detail is important. And the smallest detail can be missed, but it can cost you the biggest contract if you miss it. You understand what I'm saying? And so that was one of the things I pulled from that. Praise be to God. God's awesome. Can I share my story? Amen. 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 Now, this is one of my most priceless, priceless uh, stories. And it's, I'm almost over. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. When I tell you, we talk about testimony. There's so many things that we can talk about, that, about the goodness of God and, and the land of the living and different things that he's done for us and different things that he's shown us throughout the years. Now, I, I got relationships wrong. You know, I, had been, I went, to, uh, went in prison for, when I was 18 years old. And I got relationships wrong. I, got, I was 28 years old when I came out. And I thought I knew, you know, you know, I'm the man, you know, and I'm going to be the head of the household and, you know, get me a wife and, and you know, and rule, you know, because I'm dominant. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I got relationships wrong and I ended up experiencing two divorces. I sure did. <laughs> and I didn't quit. I didn't quit. I knew that love wasn't, I almost quit. After my last divorce, I almost quit. I, I, was, I, was, I was frustrated with, uh, with trying and, and uh, I almost threw the towel in with God. Like, oh, not with God, God, but I almost threw the towel in where relationship was concerned. But I knew that God honors marriage. I knew that God uh, desires and des destined for uh, us to be married. So I, I, was, I was like, you know, I, mean, I can't 
because if, if, if you live in a, a, a life outside of God's will and, and purpose where uh, man and woman is concerned, you can actually uh, lose yourself, you know. And so uh, I say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to just pursue a woman uh, just for the marry her, you know. And so I had met my wife currently. That's my wife over there, y'all, behind Adam. Yeah. And um, I met my wife. And she's the most the specialist thing that ever happened to me, I, I tell you that. I, I met her about, before we got married, about five years before we got married. And she, I went into a, a, a store, a convenience store, and uh, she was in there. I had the prettiest smile you ever want to see, you know. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I smiled back, and, you know, we got to talking, and she liked my smile, too. And so, we, you know, we exchanged uh, uh, phone numbers and everything, and we tried to, uh, to, try to make it work, but things didn't line up for that time. So... We ended up losing, uh, losing contact. I ended up uh, getting in a, a relationship that didn't work, and she ended up getting in a relationship that didn't work. And, and so, uh, so many years later, I bumped into her again in the store. I said, how you doing, girl? She said, I'm doing good. I say, you ain't married yet? She looked at me, married? You mean married, you know? And she, she was adamant about that. I was like, why you say it like that, you know? And, so, and she gave me a reason for saying it like that. She had a pretty good reason to say it like that. And so... I wanted, I wanted to get to know her more, so I took her out on a date. Guess where I took her at? Brought her down here in New Orleans. So I had the Natchez Queen. We took a ride, ate the buffet, you know. She had a good time, checked out New Orleans, you know. I wanted to show her a good time. I saw how she lit up when I showed her a good time. I said, this woman just needs somebody to show her that she's special, show her. Treat her special. I mean, she knew already knew she was special, but when no man don't get no shot with her, if he wasn't showing her, she, she was special. You know, if he wasn't treating her like she was special. So I did. Every time I got an opportunity to do something, I went all the way out. I went above. Out, but you know what? When, when I realized that, hey, I got her. This is my girl here. You know, yeah, she ain't going nowhere. So I wanted to go above and beyond to propose to her. Guess why I took her to propose to her? To the Bahamas. I had never been to the Bahamas before in my life. <laughs> A woman to make you do strange things. I had never even went on a cruise in my life. But uh, well, I, 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 when, when so much stuff had happened, I said, you know what? I'm taking this woman on a cruise. I ain't never been on a cruise. Me and her, I, I act like I was tough, but I was a little bit concerned, you know. But I had to let her think I was tough, you know. <laughs> we got all that, all that water out there, you know. And so I, and I proposed to her. <laughs> yes, indeed. We all out there in that water. Man, man, that was something. But... She lit up, though. I saw how she lit up. I said, it's going to be my wife until the day that I die. And I said, God, I just want to do it right. I pray to God every day. We've had our arguments. We've had our uh, falling outs here and there. You know, I think there's no marriage that, deals, that does not deal with that. And I'm not big-headed. I'm not, I don't have to be right all the time. I, I learned how to compromise. I'm going to make this marriage work because God's in the center of it. She loves the Lord. She loves what I do. She wouldn't be here supporting me. You know what I'm saying? And so this marriage is going to work. And I don't like to be, I, honestly, I don't care who, who knows how I feel about my wife. I love my wife. You understand? And I'm going to do every day. It ain't going to be me. She shut down and said, Carl, you know what? Hey, man, you, I'm going on. You, you, yeah, uh-uh. No, we're done. You know, she's going to have to do it. I, ain't, I mean, I'm going to be right there behind you. Girl, you ain't going nowhere. Come at <laughs> you, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, I love her. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love her because I know what love is. I familiarize myself with love, you know, and I don't, have, I don't always have to be right. And sometimes I just let her be right. I trips her out when, uh, when she would ask me to do something. She trips out on me. You know? Can I talk about that? Can I just be open and transparent? She trips out on me a little bit. Because that story is within stories. That story is within stories. Story is within stories. I'm going to cut this phone off. But I didn't expect that. There are stories within stories. And so she'd be, she used to trip out when she said, the yard need more? Yes, ma'am. I'm going more. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'm going more to the yard. Yeah. And it'd be something small, you know, and I'll just give her the utmost respect because she's the most beautiful thing in the world to me. But I'm about to go on and on. I know some of y'all don't want to hear that, but that's part of my testimony. That's part of my testimony. And, and, and it's so many, like, when I talk to uh, Andy, Andy, um, <laughs> Andy, I'm, I couldn't even preach. I'm telling you, look, Andy was like, hey, Carl, look, uh, are you and uh, your wife married? I mean, on your wife, are y'all, uh, you know, uh, doing what married folks do. This is before we were married now. And, uh, and I said, it's a high possibility. And uh, he said, well, look, you can't do anything. It's about the responsibility role. And he did what, what he did was right, you know, because when it comes to uh, honoring God in a sacred place, if we're not lined up the way God designed for us to line up, it's never going to work. God's never going to bless that. God's never going to anoint it. 
But what I did not want to do, I did not want to marry my wife just because of that. And so when I was not allowed to preach or teach anything, I was okay with sitting back, coming in, being fed. I was not going to marry her simply because I wanted to do a certain role or do a certain position. Because your wife is supposed to be your best friend, and she needs to know that the only reason I married her is because I took the time out to learn her and to love her and to be loved by her. Because if she didn't show me, she loved me. And we were, it wasn't, you know, and she showed me that. You understand what I'm saying? And so when that happened, that's when I, I said, hey, look, this is, this is the one, Andy. Yeah, we're ready for that. Let's make it happen. And he created the opportunity. But that was two years. That was two years. That was two years because she needed to know that she's special to me. She needed to know that she comes first. She's the first ministry before anything. She's the first ministry. I know I'm putting you on the spot, baby. <laughs> yeah, but she is. She's my first ministry, and she comes first with everything, you know, before God. You know, she comes first. God comes first, and she comes. She comes first on everything outside of God. Amen. Amen. God bless. Hey, man, that's so where we at now. Oh, man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up for questions uh, right now. We're going to take an intermission right now, Andy. Okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to uh, take an intermission. We had uh, planned to do something. Here, so let's shut it down for right now. And doing this testimony, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do an intermission. I don't see, I don't hear it raining, so we might be a little luck going back home, y'all today. Amen. We can jump right into let's it. jump right into it. All right. I, I did have a couple of questions I, I want to ask, and then we also want to open up the floor if any of y'all have any questions to do some Q and A. Amen. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, so so you was 18. Yeah. Right? I was 18. What what kind of music was you listening to around that time? Yeah, that was a, a big uh, that was that was Scarface, Meet My Little Friend, which mm -hmm. is one reason why I had a pistol around with me. Uh that was uh that was clutch. Uh, and uh, of course you had Ice Cube, BZ, you know, they had the so uh, Gangster Rap. Yeah, gangster Rap. Gangster Rap was uh I, it was it was the thing that I was most familiar with, yeah. So how much of an impact do you think that had on your life? It had a whole bunch of impact on my life. Because when you hear people talking about lyrics that you see every day, it draws you to and some of the stuff you, you don't see, but you become, it imitates. And you, you, want, to, you want to imitate it. You want to be it. it and, and some of those guys were doing stuff that, and some of them weren't even doing the stuff that they were putting out there. But when they would put it out there in the way that they would put it out there, it would feel good to us, and we would do it. Yeah. It was appealing to you. It was appealing to me, yeah. And people, and they had lyrics, you know, you didn't want to take no uh, junk. You didn't want, you wanted to be known and respected, so you did things for that reason. Right, because yeah. of what you was listening to, it was, what you was looking at, and just sitting entering the eyes and the ears. That's, well, so, all right, let's say you, right now, the man or God you are right now, could walk up to you, 17 years old, what would you tell him? <laughs> At 17 years old, I wanted, uh, I wanted a mentor. And so there was no one, here's the truth, and I thought about this, there was no one that would mentor me in the way that I needed to be mentored. That's why I go back into the prisons. That's why I go back into the juvenile detention centers. Because I know that I was smart enough that if you'd have gave me a reason to do things the right way, I'd have done it with all my heart. But nobody did that, and there were so many people that gave me a reason to do things the wrong way, and I did it with all my heart. So is that why you go into the neighborhoods with the barbecue truck? Can you talk about that? That's exactly why I go into the neighborhood with the barbecue truck and talk about that, for the simple fact that I wish somebody would have done that to me. And people think about when they, they when I, when you talk about the the uh, the, the the incident, the, the murder. When you talk about that, I took something from a family that I could not give back, and I had a time with that in prayer with God. I some of that family, I, that family, it happened in Monroe, Louisiana. And some of my Facebook friends may be related to that guy. And if I had something to say to any of them, 
you know, I've never got the opportunity to tell any of them I'm sorry. But the reason that I do what I do is because I'm sorry. I can't not serve for the simple fact that I serve because that's my way of restoring hope and restoring life to people who I can restore hope and restore life to. That's why I do it. That's why I put myself on a limb and share what I share in the way that I do it. That's why I'll be in the, 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 the jail, work release facility, feeding men uh, a, face, uh, a Father's Day dinner uh, this Sunday because that's my way of restoring, restoring hope, restoring life. Yeah, that's my way, yeah. And it, it goes back to the word, to whom much has been forgiven, much is grateful. Because yeah. I see the joy that you have, like, you know, just going state to state, because I wish we could just take you everywhere with us, but, you know, just dealing with people and different people, and it's just so much, like, you, you see the passion there, and just hearing your story, you know what I'm saying, and just yeah. knowing how how much, how it's needed, and that's why, like, in the beginning when I said, oh, he never says no, because he's really never told me no. The only thing he's ever said was, well, I have something on that date, so we would right. move it to another date. But you said something so powerful because, yeah, you tell people no, but when it lines up yeah, with, with God's will, you know. So uh, how important do you think that is, if you could tell the people and people watching online, to connect with people that have the same vision you have. Because, yeah. you know, there's more, there's several different churches, you know, yeah. and they called to do different things because together we're the body of Christ. Every yeah. church can't do everything, everything that we're doing. Because we can't do everything that this other church is doing. And that's right. a, so vital, I think, because it, it's so easy to fall into pride and like, well, yeah, well, we going out here and we moving and shaking and we going to the projects and where are you going? But this church might be heavily interceding for everybody that's going yeah. out you know like so what so just talk about like the vitality of getting connected with a church and a family that wow. has the same aim and vision that God has but given. you have no idea how this is going to connect right now uh, like when I first moved from Monroe to New Orleans um, the church that I was actually going to is the church we passed by when you actually came in, which is First Baptist of Avondale. Great church, great pastor. But the only reason uh, that my two brothers right here are sitting in front of me, that pastor had a poster come across his uh, desk, and it was Bill Glass Prison Ministry, and this is what he said. He said, Carlton, I need to see you in my office. You know, when the pastor call you in his office, you know, they think you're in trouble or something. But he said, look, um, you know, prison ministry is it's just not my thing. Uh, but I know it, it's yours. I know you have a heart for it. This came across my table. Now, he was sensitive to the spirit of God. He's a great guy. Right. You know, I, he was sensitive to the spirit of God, but he was honest. And he said, it's just not my thing, but I know it's yours. And he gave me the thing. I made the phone call and did some incredible things after that. The flyer that so many of y'all seen with um, me on the flyer with the microphone in my hand, it was uh, the night in Kansas. We went through all kind of uh, several different prisons in the state of Kansas, and I was mentored by uh, James Henderson, big James Henderson. This guy right here is an incredible speaker. I mean, just phenomenal, and, and just I mean, just just he, this he was the this guy was the four-time world champion, bench press and champion, but he was also, he's also in the Guinness World Book of Record of being the first man to ever lift over 700 pounds without any support of steroids or illegal substance, you know, and he mentored me. This guy was just not a big guy in physical stature. He was a big guy. He is a big guy in character. He's a big guy in spirit, and he was and he very skillful in his uh, delivery speech, and he mentored me that weekend, and so what I, I I said that to say this here, that when I looked up and I saw Andy doing the things that he was doing in the community, well, we actually met in the Brevard Detention Center. And so we met actually, like he said earlier, in the field doing work. And so we, I started, I was, you know, you, other minutes to check out, you know, the style and everything that other minute he was effective. And so when I saw what he was doing, I was like, man, man of like spirit. And so it was consistent. It was consistent. I had got the barbecue pit, and he, he called me up. He knew I had the barbecue pit. We want to do this here, over here for these people, how much. And it was, none, it was not a thing. He just had a passion. I just watched his passion. And I was like, man, this is before One Accord even came into existence. One Accord was just in him. It wasn't even in existence. He just had a heart for people. And so I'm like watching this guy move like, like I move, but in a different way. You know, he had a different gift, but he had the same passion. And so when I saw that, and then 
things happen. And this is one of the reasons he, he, I watched him. This is one significant reason I watched him. We was up under the bridge in New Orleans, and there was another guy that was with the group, and he was trying to minister to this guy. You know, sometimes there's certain people you can talk to that, you know, that other people can't talk to and certain people you can't talk to. And so this guy was talking to this guy, and he was losing him and watching him. I'm just cooking on the grill, and I'm watching him. And before the guy was completely gone, I saw Andy. Andy was watching just like I was watching, but Andy was close. And Andy made a beeline, hey, 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 brother. And, and, and the guy turned around, and Andy started talking to the guy, and it was a different thing. It was a different anointing. The guy's eyes lit up because of how Andy was, was, was speaking to him from the past. And, and the guy opened up and started crying, he gave his life to the Lord right there. And I was like, wow. This boy got something special on him, you know, and it wasn't just, you know, and it wasn't just, and I don't say that just to toot the horn. I mean, he, he, the boy can rap. I don't know if y'all, I mean, the boy can, I mean, can rap. But and this, I, this is your touch. No, 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 but, I'm, I'm, but this is what pulled me. We, we're talking about the, the slight vision. Right, this is what, right, kept, right. what, what brought, brought everything into fruition. And he would rap about things that I could relate to from the street, and it was cut, and it was, you know, it wasn't religious. It was scripture. It was scripture, and I was like, because I've heard some people that do try to do Christian rap, and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't scripture, you know. And it was scripture; it was line upon line. Nobody could say what he said that didn't study. And so, and I was like, okay, okay, that's cool. And so, man, when the time came out, you know, it, it, I just, I, I had to line up with him. And then when the church, when he opened up the church, and and he started doing the, I said, you know, I'm, I'm there, man. I just want to support this gift, and, and that's, and that's, and I supported the gift. Uh, I, I fell in love with the person who possessed the gift, man. The, the brother is a, a beloved brother, you know, of me. So when you talk about, you know, things connecting, that's, that's, that's how we connected. Same spirit, same, same mind. Now, when I brought up the church down, I love them. I, I, I love them. And, and, and I still love them. And I still go and do things over there with them. But it, it's just that uh, this church, we have the same spirit. We have the same passion. They do prison. They do street. Because some people don't... Um, can't relate to people in the street. I'm a street man. I'm 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 a street. I'm gonna die. The street, I'm just, that's I'm I'm being honest. I can relate to people in the street because I'm from the street. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I can I I, try, I commun communicate, communicate with everyone, but I come from the street. I know where I come from. You know. And the people there's so many people that can relate cannot relate to the people that I know are relatable. They cannot relate to the people that I know that God loves. So if they can't get love from those people that, that can't relate to them, and don't make them a bad person, they just can't relate to them, then I'm going to focus on what I believe God is calling me to, and that's to relate to the people in the streets. That's to relate to the people in, in the pen that have done things that certain people don't even want to talk or touch them in no kind of way. You understand what I'm saying? I've been, I've, 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 there are people who, do, who don't want to touch and talk to me in any kind of way, you know? And I get it, but that's all right. I'm used by a vessel by God to, 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 do a, to go to a place and go to places that people wouldn't dare find themselves at, but I'm cool with it, yeah. Man, so when you got denied parole, did you have write-ups? None. No write-ups. No right. The only reason they denied you were me. You trustee status at the time. Yes. Minimum security. Yes. And they denied you. Yes. Can I tell you the only scripture uh -huh. that got me through was what Paul had said. I was perplexed, but I wasn't in despair, which means I was puzzled why they didn't. I was, I was, I was hurt, you know, but I didn't lose hope in God. It was a crisis of faith, but I didn't lose hope in God. Yeah. I want you to expound on that because I think somebody needs to hear that. Yes. Because you, you got the out, like you're able, like when you told a testimony, you was able to show why, but when you was going through it, you didn't know yeah, why, but I didn't. you stood on that scripture, yeah, right? Can I, you expound on that? Yeah, I, I knew one thing. God had brought me that far, right? That I knew that. I, I knew God had brought me to that particular point. God had done some incredible things, like the rain and everything, you know. So those things were still in my mind. And so when I, I couldn't turn my back on God, I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand why I didn't make parole. And it was God's way of teaching me to trust me when you can't see. Trust me when you don't understand. And so story, like I told you about Paul, perplexed but not despair. But another story came up when Jesus was walking with the multitude, these stories proved to be so important in my life, man. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. So many incredible stories that we can learn from. Jesus was walking with the disciples, and he shared with them about the blood and the flesh, and there was a multitude of people around it. 
Well, when the people heard about the blood and the flesh, the ones that didn't understand what he was talking about, they turned and walked away from him. Well, he turned to his 12 disciples. He said, they left. Y'all going to leave? Peter spoke up and said, where are we to go? You're the only one to have the words of eternal life, the words we need to live by. So what Peter was saying, well, we don't understand what you just said, neither. But we ain't going nowhere. We're going to stick in your presence until we understand, until we get the picture. And they got the, as long as they, when they, because they stayed, because they stayed in his presence, they eventually got to a point to where they actually understood what he was saying there, but they didn't understand it then. They had to keep walking with him until, they could, until it would unfold, the understanding would unfold. As long as I kept walking with God and I got to that place, that I didn't really understood it. Until, I didn't really understand it until I actually was sitting at that. And I, was, I was like, whoa! <laughs> I was sitting at that years until they understood. I was sitting there, man, I was in nine for a row to meet Jihad. That's my buddy now. That's my, I mean, we talk on the phone all the time. You know what I'm saying? God connected. God divinely connects us with people for his purpose in our life. He wants to bless us. The Bible said that God has a, a hope and a future for each one of us. But the only way we can get to his hope and his future for us is if we stick in his presence. We, we got to stick in his presence. God bless. <clears throat> God's doing something. All right, because there's so much layers to your testimony, right? Yeah. And, it's, and I know this because my testimony is like that. Right, and right. It's certain times, like, God would just shift me here with the te- like, because it's just so much, right? Right. And I have to do another night. Yeah. But just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, yeah. because when you was up here, because I remember, I remember going to prison. And they, 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 they started a new program when I went in there. I was at the Quincy, and they started a new program where they was bringing the guys from Angola with lights. Yeah. But they was bringing them yeah. for prison, for, for ministry, for the prison ministry. Right. Like, to start the church in the prison that I was in, right? Yeah. So, you know, when you go through ARDC, and uh, when you first get in there, and you, you, you talk to these guys, and I remember, and they was telling us, they showed a faith-based film, and they was talking about the min- prison ministry, going to church in prison, and... I, I was uh, like, yeah. I was so corrupted. Yeah, right. Like, I, 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 this is this is how crazy my logic, my my logical what I was logical yeah. thinking to me at that time. I was like, I didn't come to jail to be good because if I would have, if I would have <laughs> yeah, been good, yeah. I should have been good in the streets and I wouldn't be. A in lot jail. of people think so, like that. Yeah, just, I know exactly just, what you're. Just yeah. the enemy. He's so he's so, he's so disgusting. He's such a liar. Yeah. But I'm getting to. Because when I seen the men coming from Angola that was involved to start the church there, they had the joy of the Lord. Yeah. Like, they was happy. And I was like, they, they lost their mind. Yeah. Like, this is how they must be coping with never going home because they, they must have just went crazy. Yeah. But now I understand. And just hearing your testimony, too, because now I was like, man, they had the joy of the Lord over them. Yeah. Because, and looking at it, they're more free then most of the population walking yes. out of here in bondage and depressed and oppressed, right? Yes. And then just a, the, a part of your testimony that jumped out is when you said how you were in prison and you just dove into the Bible and just, it was like exploding these stories and it was giving you this joy yeah. that is unspeakable, right? So, and I, and I really, like, there's, there's so much going on in this day and age with depression and oppression and suicide has went up yeah, and all yeah. of it because people's faith is in the wisdom of man and not the power of God. So now, do you do? get this or this or is there going to be another wave and this and just people are so yeah. oppressed and depressed right now I, I, I think I think we're, we're going here just show, how, how vital was it how much of a lifeline was this when you were sitting in, you could say you was in the belly of the beast when well, everybody's doing everything corrupted around you and you had to hold on to this I had to and it was one time I almost defaulted in that too uh, shortly after I had got to Winfield, it was a big gang fight took place. Now, originally, I'm from Monroe, Louisiana, from the, from, the, from the heart of Booger T and Newtown. And so what happened was it was a big gang fight between Baton Rouge, and, uh, Baton Rouge New Orleans was against uh, Monroe and Shreveport. Monroe and Shreveport uh, hung tight. So one of the guys that uh, was, a, was a, from Monroe, from my hometown, he knew who I was. He knew what I was about on the street. And so what he did, he said, it's about to go down in the big, it's about to go down in the big yard. So, you know, we about to meet up out there. So at first I was like, 
You know, I was about it. And so when, when, when it, I'm saved now, and I had to catch myself. I really did, because it involved somebody that I was from the same neighborhood with. And so I was getting ready to go out there, and God immediately, this is the first time I heard the still small voice of God. The God immediately spoke to me when I got to the gate. I had this thought. When I say I heard the still voice, I had this thought that came to my mind. If you go out there, that's going to be the way you're going to have to live the entire time you're here at this prison. And I was like, whoa. I said, you know what? I was at the gate. They looking at me. They waiting on me. It's not worth it. I'm trying to go home. I'm trying to. I'm trying to do something. I said, nah, man, y'all. And I told them, you know, back. And they respected me later. I didn't care whether they had something to say about it. But the day I knew I couldn't go out there, and it got bloody out there. They, they it got bloody out there. It really did. And um, and so I, I, I didn't go. I, I didn't go out there. But when you was talking about the, uh, the, 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 the guys from prison. Going into the jail from Angola, coming in, and the joy of, and I dove into the word. I thought about something. I, I always wondered, I, just, Revelation just came to me just then when you said that. I always wondered, I was the MA pastor. I didn't ask for it. At every facility I went to except for one. And that was in Alexandria. I was a minister, but I wasn't the MA pastor. But I, was, I became the MA pastor at, at when? I went to Alexandria. I was a minister. They shipped me to. Uh, Farmerville, Union Parish, and because, here's the thing, they were using me, but it was, it was a good way. They, they knew that inmates with God on the inside is vital for the ones without God because if that atmosphere does not exist within those prisons, it would be a constant chaos. And I never thought about, never pursued any of it. Became the best friend of the warden. He called me one day in Union Parish. He called me into his office. He was an ex-Marine, and he started talking to me. He just wanted to, I know he was trying to see who I was. I didn't kiss nobody, but I just was who I was. And I was who I was for the reason I, I was who I was. And he, he took a liking to that because he needed peace in his facility. So whatever I needed to get done, he made it possible. I was, I was like a Joseph <laughs> in Union Parish, sure did. And, and, and I, me and Gary, that's why I met Gary, G -hop. and um, me and Gary tried to contact him uh, early last year. And we were told some horrendous news. He died of cancer two years before. And, but here's the thing, and I went to Columbia. I went to Columbia, and there was this warden that was there. He wanted to know. I had a buddy of mine, a friend of mine, so Robert Ross. He was friends with the warden. He knew the warden, and he used my ability to do leather uh, to get me to meet the warden. And the warden needed to find out some things. He did the same thing, basically. Powell, Warden Powell, did the same thing in Columbia. He wanted to talk to me. He had the chaplain to call me into his office, and they asked me, about being the pastor. They had never had a pastor at the facility. Yeah, and he asked me about being the pastor. And it was something that came natural to me. I knew that people needed to be rooted and grounded in Christ because I had to be rooted and grounded in Christ. I knew people needed to know their purpose. And so it was, those were first lessons that were taught. I knew people needed to understand what it means to be born again. You got so many people walking around here that they'll say they're born again, but don't even know what it means to be born again. They'll say they've experienced salvation, but don't even know what it means to, you know, so I knew those were lessons that need to be taught. What does it mean to be delivered? What does it mean to be free from uh, sin? What you, you know, so I, and, and I knew those, those are things that are just constant. I was pumped that in my, in, in my system. So the, when I got to the prison, and, and I had homeboys from Booker T, from, and that's the, now I'm going to tell you, that's the clutch. That's the clutch of, of prison life that I had to be wise enough not to fall into. When I first went into the, the jail, the, the big house, the first experience into the big house, the first dorm I went into, some of the homeboys I hadn't seen in years right there. When I walked in there, they was like, Lil Red, that's my dad's name, Red, and Lil Red, oh, God, that's you. I was like, wow, this is where y'all been? And I could have accepted that, and a lot of people do. I watched it. 
I could have accepted that, like, you know, this is a place to belong, you know, all my people here. But I knew, because I had got saved before I even got there, I knew that they didn't belong there just like I didn't belong there. But they just don't know it yet. And I had a mission. And one, Jojo was one of the first ones I came in country. He really was. Now, Jojo, you can't keep him from talking about Jesus on the outside now. He loves the Lord. And, he, and his testimony is similar to mine. But he just gave his life to the Lord not long ago. And he's doing a great work for God, you know. And so when you, but the, the, the thing is, it's so easy to get caught in that trap. And you have to know where you belong and where you don't belong. And the only way we can know that is we stay in contact with the manufacturer. He shows us who we are and where we need to be and how we need to get there. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I'd like to ask you, uh, how was your relationship with your earthly dad? And yeah. would that have had any influence on how you viewed God? You know, hey. what's your, what your, what your relationship with your dad? Because I know sometimes we can. No, that's a good, good question. My dad has, uh, I want to be honest, always been a dad. It's a good question. And it has a really good answer. However, he, can I be honest? So many of us say we believe in God. He wasn't connected to God like he should have been. A prophet came into the first prison I was at. You know what he told me? He said that was an anointing on your dad's life. Your dad rejected it. The anointing that your dad was supposed to have, you should walk in. That's what he told me. And when I, my dad, when he, he was a dad. He was there. Anytime the car broke down, he dad, you know, boom. But from a carnal standpoint, natural standpoint, when I got close to coming home, I got to tell it. I got to tell it. When I got close to coming home, he, uh, he had a, a cafe shop, and I needed somebody to, you know, I was looking for work. You know, I, I needed a work release facility, and he, had a, he, he could get me out. I was close to Monroe, so I was in Columbia, so he could get me out so I can come to the, his cafe and, uh, and work. And, and I did that. But I was learning things in the Bible. Now, i got to be honest, right? You know, my dad had ways that he, he talked about different things, women. And he thought that I would be excited about listening to those conversations. And because he was dad and because he was doing what he was doing, I had to, you know, I, 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 for, for a little time I, 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 I absorbed it. But then I had to take a stand and let him know that I didn't like talking about different things of that nature. He respected it. But one thing that he did do that I really honored, and it was spiritual, I was a time in prison where I had spun a long gap without seeing nobody, and I was upset with him. And one of the first things he did when I got in the first feed, when the first time he picked me up to take me, uh, was apologize and ask me. He literally asked for forgiveness, and I forgave him. It was a situation in prison. A friend of mine's I had in prison that. It was a big example. His name is Kelvin Flagg. He was a friend of mine. He stayed in New Orleans somewhere. I don't even know where he stayed. But he was from New Orleans. But this thing stood out to me where his dad, he had a dad that every visit would come up there, visit him, put money on his books. And we all knew that when visitation came, Kelvin's dad was coming. And so he'd come back in. And, and I never got envious of him. I just always thought, well, where's my dad, you know? If, if, if Kevin's dad could love him enough that while he's in this place, he could come every day, every visitation, and show the where's. I felt like that. I felt like that. 
Now, my dad came up and, and did some things, but it was, a, it was a dysfunctional relationship, but it's getting better. It's getting better. That's, and that's, that's what I can honestly say, because it's, it's getting better. That's, that's what, yeah. Any more questions? I got a question right there. Um, this story touches me a lot because I feel like um, guys with backgrounds, they, didn't, they don't get a chance or like a voice or any help like to get back into the real world and the things that are going on, it's like they're forced to go back to the same thing that they've been trying to run from or just, you know, figure out a way, like what would some advice that you would give to a person that's trying their hardest, but it seems like that world just keeps pulling you back and yeah. no matter how hard you try, or like what help you look for, it just keeps on like reoccurring. Right. And it's just I just I'm. I know where you're at. My um, my boyfriend mm -hmm. is incarcerated right now, so it's good that I came here because right. I'm learning so much just from just sitting here, and it's touching me. Right, Scott. Like because I've always wanted to like find people that. You know, wanted to better guys, that, not just everybody in general that has been that can relate to, them. yeah. Or, you know, just to get them in the process of knowing that they're not by themselves. Right, or, that's clutch, right there. What you just said, they're not by themselves. It's just so much stuff, and I just appreciate being here and experiencing that because whenever he calls me, I'm gonna let him know yeah. what I learned today. And Praise God. I'm hoping that, like, he, he, he bought him a Bible, right. $10 in jail for a Bible. <laughs> yeah. He bought him one, and he's always been close to God and stuff like that, but we talk every day, and now it's like we talk about, if I go to church, I'll give him what I learned. Yeah, that's or awesome. That's if, clutch. if I, like, I'll pray for him before I get off the phone or, you know, stuff like that to keep him right. in church. And just the other day he called me, and he's like, Oh, these guys in here from off the streets that, you know, he got into it with or whatever, and they're trying to pull him back into that yeah, yeah, crazy yeah. It happens. world in there. And I'm telling him, no, that's a distraction. This is a test. Yeah. You have to push forward. You have to, I'm sorry, you have to. Um, Trust God, yeah. You have to. Be quiet, be still, stand still. Yeah, yeah. like I don't know how to explain it. I just know. That I just appreciate and I thank you. That's You're welcome. Okay. You're welcome. I, I, I do wanna uh, I do wanna say this. Uh, it's clutch to have. Uh, uh, and I say clutch, I mean it's a good thing to have. It's uh, uh, a real good uh, thing to to to, to use and uh, it's a good support system. When I came home, uh, there was a guy by the name of David Otis. He had a prison ministry, prison and outreach ministry in Monroe, Louisiana called Lifeline Prison and Outreach Ministry. And what he did was open up the avenue for me to come around uh, people who were just getting out. And, and he actually was going around in different facilities uh, ministering at. And so he knew that I was capable of, of doing that. And he actually put me to work. Like he came, like when I came home, well, the first month I came home, I went into the the uh, the prison I had got out of the next month. But he had other prisons that he would allow me to go in uh, with him, and so that that boost. And I, watching that guy, he had he was facing 40 years, and he ended up getting out of prison in two years, eight months, something like that. There, but when he came into the the main prison that I was in, that's how I met him. And for him to, 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 that's why I do what I do, too. That guy was such an encouragement and inspiration to me when he came back in, kind of like Moses, leaving, the, leaving Egypt and coming back to get the children of Israel. He came back in, and that gave me that picture right there. And so what I would say about your, your boyfriend, he needs a good support system. Because one of the things David told me, 
David Otis, not King David. You know, I talk about King David a lot. But one of the things David Otis told me was, and I'll never, I'll never forget it, it was a great expression from him. He said, Carlton, he said that uh, a lot of people can't relate to us. He said, it's, it's okay to go to other churches here and there, but they're not going to relate to us. You know, so because you come from where you come from, it's good to be around people who can understand and relate to who you are, where you come from, and can communicate with you in an effective way. And he wasn't lying because I did go to different places and I paid attention to behavior patterns and behavior modes. And, and when people find out you've been to prison, it's not everybody, but a good bit of them, they don't want to be around you, and they treat you as if you're going to take the purse or something like, you know what I'm just saying? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's true. And so it's, if, if, if you're not mature enough, you'll be like, you get upset, you get mad, you get frustrated, you know. But I've learned to look at it and laugh. Yeah, I've learned to uh, just, you know, accept it for what it is, you know, because some people just don't know. And it's not your fault that they just don't know. And some people just don't care. It's not your fault that you just don't care. I made, it, I made it up in my mind that I'm going to do what's right for me. Nobody around me has to understand. You know, if, I, if, if them having a lack of understanding is revealed, that's their problem. I shouldn't get mad. I shouldn't get offended. That's their problem. It has nothing to do with my pathway, with my pathway. And I see a lot of brothers that come out, they want everybody to accept them. That's the first mistake. You can't want everybody to accept you. You have to know that you accept yourself and that God accepts you. One of the clutch, most clutch verses that I've, I've, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's so key right there. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you can never love no one else effectively. You have to love yourself first. And so that's, I, I love myself enough to say, I can make it through anything. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Guess what? I believe it. I know I'm whole. I know I'm complete. I know what's in me. I believe what God says. So uh, there's no man on earth that can discourage me from going down my pathway. God gave it to me. And I'm going to trust God every step of the way. I may hit some bumps. I may hit some uh, obstacles here and there. But because I love myself, and it doesn't matter what no one else say or whatever no one else think. That's, that's going to be the difference maker. That's going to be the difference maker. So when he comes out, you know, encourage him to uh, not look for acceptance. Because some of them make the mistake of looking for acceptance from everyone else. Don't look for acceptance. Just be you. Learn who you are and be you. Amen. 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 <laughs> oh, uh, you have Eddie? another question? Well, you can donate to my ministry here at One Accord. I got a cash app. Uh, the cash app is... Uh, a matter of fact, we could do that right now. I, wanna, I wanted to do that. Okay. He, he didn't know anything about that. Uh. But um, I want to take up an offering for the man of God. It's going to go directly to hit sow into him. The, okay. We're going to sow into you also. We're going to get God. you on the cash app. But I wanted to extend that opportunity for everybody here to sow into a man of God. And after hearing a testimony like that, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of things, faith without works is dead. And that's just, that's a way, that's a way of honoring God and honoring the man of God and sowing into his life, which is fertile soil. Because I don't take this lightly. I don't Amen. just let anybody up here. Those of y'all that know me know that. Because this is not my pulpit. This is not my church. This is God's church. And it's whoever God permits to be up here. I'm just, I, I'm just a vessel. I just say yes because when God speaks, that's the only thing we should say is yes. You know what I'm saying? So I want to pray over that seed. Remember, there's no seed too big or too small. You know, like God gives seed to the sower. Amen. And mm -hmm. if you're doing it in faith, I just encourage you to just put a name on that seed. Farmers don't just throw seed. They know what they're planting. They right. know, they know what season it is, and they know what 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 they expect. So when you sow the seed, I, I just encourage you to sow the seed with expectancy with an expectation and just 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 
give it to God. It's God, look, this is seed. Uh, this is seed that I'm sowing because of this, because of that, because of that. And God knows, amen. And He's faithful, amen. And, and amen. this is fertile soil. So I want to give that opportunity right now before we close out. So uh, I want to pray over that seed, amen, as I pray amen. over you and amen. the harvest of it, amen, for everyone that sows into it. Those online, if, you, if you're going to uh, sow through the one accord, if you could just put in your description, this is a seed for the testimony, amen. So uh, let, let, let's pray. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you've already touched the people's heart to sow into the man of God, Father. Father, we know that it does not return back void, Father. So I just pray that the windows of heaven open up and you pour a supernatural blessing upon your people that they don't have room enough to hold, Father. I just speak overflow. Increase their wisdom, their knowledge, their understanding, their discernment, Father. Whatever area they have lacking, Father, I pray for an overflow yes. in that area, Lord. Lord, I stand in expectation of hearing the testimony testimonies that come Hallelujah. from the testimony night, Father. Father, yes. I lift my brother up to you along with his cares and his burdens, yes. Father. I thank you for him. I thank you for the mouthpiece that, you, you, that you're rising up for this season yes. and this time right now, Lord. Lord, so I just speak life over him and his wife, over that union, Father, as you yes. have joined the two, that nothing can separate, that you would just proceed to transform them in your image from glory to glory as you are the center. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you yes. honor, in praise, and glory in the almighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come forward with your seed.